Hi everyone. <clears throat> Just waiting for Shauna to join. Hey Thea. Apologies in advance for my voice. Um, I didn't lose it through having any um, fun over the weekend. I was actually trying to break up a fight between my dogs and I must have um, scratched my vocal cords. The chat and she should be coming in screen shortly. There she is. Hey. Oh, hi. <laughs> Hello, all the way from the other side of the world. How are you? Good, life is good. The sun is out. I'm working on my tan. Obviously, while well, sun cream as well. Don't want any burnt skin. Yeah, safety first always. But life is good. Well, it's so good to see your face and have a bit of a catch up with you. Can you give us a, let's just kick off, like what's happening in the SB world right now? And what's taking you over to the Cayman Islands? So my, my prim, primary role here is what would we probably see as rugby development officer. And I spend a lot of time with girls and boys, but mainly girls in schools, essentially taking their PE lessons. And as we know, like same in the UK, a lot of PE teachers are not confident with rugby, but they're brave enough to kind of let us as a, as a rugby club, as Cayman Rugby Football Union, go in or they come to us and, and we just just teaching them rugby. So I do spend a lot of my time telling kids to run forwards, pass, back, because so many of them are so brand new to it. But when they do it, I'm like, oh, it's fantastic. And they score a little try and they have their own little celebrations. And I um, yeah, just basically a full-time coach here in Cayman Islands. And does it take you back to when you first started and some of the comments that you're now <laughs> giving and coaching, were they some of the things that would talk to you as well? Yeah, it's the, it's the whole well, parting backwards, run forward stuff when everyone is always constantly offside because rugby is not almost what, what comes to your head. And sometimes I'm like, is it me? Am I saying something wrong? Because everyone's just offside. I'm like, stop. Stop. Who <laughs> here right now is any good to your ball carrier? They're like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> and I'm just going, Argh! So it's certainly, <laughs> certainly testing me as a, as a person, as a character. And now, like you say, I kind of understand how frustrating it would have been for someone teaching me when I almost definitely would have been constantly offside as well. It's, um, yeah. And, you know, I know that you're somebody who will always challenge yourself, try new things. Did you ever expect to be doing a full-time coaching job in another country? Not at all. Like, there's no reason for me to think that because... I've only, I've never really travelled much with rugby, especially compared to athletics. So a lot of travel in rugby was the Six Nations, nations, and that was about it. And then obviously, except for the World Cup. So it's kind of, I don't know, almost surprising, slash not surprising that other people actually play. You know, when it's just not your world, so you don't associate it with um, other countries playing. But I do, I do really enjoy coaching. I enjoy that sort of foundation level of coaching because ultimately like we're here as coaches to just get people to connect with rugby and, and enjoy it and when, when you win it, it's great on top and, it, and it's a lots of fun but I really like the sort of rawness and freshness and we have a, a, a group on a Saturday morning which is which is well, just club so people come voluntarily it's not people who don't want to be there I'm like oh I don't like rugby bro. everyone wants to be there so that's a very different vibe but even then, you can tell when someone's brand new because they're always a the person who's like putting in 25 tackles in, in 25 minutes and running around as much as possible. Um, so that's, that's, yeah, that's a kind of, of level of, of coaching I enjoy because they're just like sponges at, at that young age and they just want to know more and they always ask questions. And I always want questions because it, it sort of proves understanding and it means you understand a bit of what I'm saying, but you want to know a bit more. And for me, that, that shows interest. But yeah, I, I do I do like coaching at this age. But I didn't see myself coaching in another country um, straight after retiring. I mean, it's such a cool opportunity. And I know you're working with Mercedes Foy, who is a former England player and um, T-Bird hero. Um, I mean, she's such a joy to work around. But a big message that you often talk about is making sure that people can see it and be it and you feel that you have a responsibility to show people that 
you know, you're somebody from a different background, you come from a different sport, but you can still make it. Is that really important to you? Yeah, so a lot of, a lot of my work here, um, Mercedes is, is a fantastic human. She's the kind of person everyone needs a Mercedes in yeah. their life. So yeah. I just type her, she's so enthusiastic, always wants to do everything all of the time and just takes so much ownership and pride in everything she does. And yeah, so she's a, a great human for me to have um, here, but also for Cayman Rugby to have her as, as an employee and her passion just shines through every single day. But it's all about the growth of, of rugby and the club and being here in, in Cayman Islands and it's still rugby's has a similar image shall we say here as it does in the UK i.e. as a lot of white middle class men who play so for example the men's side they have four teams just about whereas so they can play each other on island whereas the women not well they just about have one team and even then it's only just going up to 15 so they've played a lot of 10s and 12s um, but the difference in the demographic when you're looking at the men playing it is a lot of expats it is just like a lot of the same images of what you would see at home but the women's side is a lot more mixed and, and the club itself are so passionate about getting out to local people so people who are born and bred here in Cayman or, or elsewhere in the Caribbean and it's not just about getting uh, English or Irish or Scottish or home nations people that are here expats to play but it's about getting local people and literally taking it to them. So part of my role is going into schools. Schools come to us as well, but we actually go into schools and going into a mixture of both private and government schools. And again, that's like you said, that, that would have been me in a government school. Nobody brought rugby to me as a kid. And, and if they did, maybe her world would, would be different already. But it's just that chance to bring rugby to people who you know, don't see themselves. They literally will look at a rugby pitch or, or look, watch a rugby game on TV and they don't see them on the pitch. So then why would they think, oh, I must try rugby? Um, but even how I speak and like you say, how I look, and there's a lot of confused faces when they see me. Because first, someone tells you, your rugby coach is turning up and you get me. And I'm like, oh, hi, guys. So they're thinking, you're a woman and you're mixed race. You're not supposed to be a rugby coach. That's not what rugby coaches look like. But then they also, before I speak, they think I'm Caymanian because of my skin tone, because of my hair, and that's what they associate with locals. So again, it's like local people certainly don't, don't do rugby. What, why are you here? And then I speak with my accent, and then they're even more confused. Like, who, what are you? Like, who are you? Why are you? <laughs> I don't know what to think. You're supposed to be a rugby coach, a mixed racial woman, and you sound like you're from South London. Um, it's a lot of confusion. <laughs> Even that, it's just like spiking interest. It's a different, literally a different voice and a different accent and just even my hair. The amount of girls just comment on my hair like, oh, Miss, you've got really cool hair. I'm like, yeah, cool. You can have cool hair too if you play rugby. Like everything I do is about getting <laughs> girls in rugby and just tricking them into it. Like, yeah. Well, I, I can definitely see the pair of you and Mercedes and the growth and the development that you're going to create over there will be incredible. Um, which I think this kind of leads into a little bit about being your authentic self and, you know, turning up and not trying to be anybody that you're not. I mean, you very much are a say it how it is kind of girl and we love you for it. But where have you always found it easy to be that way? Or has it been something that you've grown and it's developed over time? Uh, short answer, no, I've not always found it easy I also didn't realise it was a thing. Like, there was always growing up, um, to be fair, in South London, it wasn't, it wasn't so bad because there's so much mixture of, of different types of people. But then moving out to Kent, where the demographic is very different, I'm like, whoa, some people literally don't even understand what I'm saying here with my accent or I like, want to talk about the TV shows or the music I listen to. And it's like, oh, you're a bit, you're a bit different. And so I kind of tried to, try to fit into to their box but it didn't feel right. And I was just like, this, I don't, like, I literally don't like the music or I literally, I want some hot pepper sauce on my food, but I'm a bit afraid to ask for it. But I don't ever ask for it. Um, just so everybody understands, no matter what Shauna is eating, she has to have hot sauce on it. Like, it doesn't matter <laughs> what it is, there's always a bottle of hot sport sauce. So when you, when you do like a traditional, what's in your kit bag, you can expect hot sauce in Shauna's <laughs> kit bag and probably a, a jar of, is it cockles? I've actually got a jar for you here. 
that was a yeah. going away present that we didn't meet each other before you went. But now I've got these goggles that I definitely aren't going to wear. They'll keep. So they'll they'll, they'll keep for when you come home. But but yeah, they'll definitely be a hot sauce somewhere in Shauna's bag. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Even in my travelling bag coming out here, got some hot pepper sauce just because you never know. <laughs> Since tops up. Uh, but yeah, in terms of like being comfortable with myself, it, it's hard. It's hard emotionally. It's hard when you first start realising that I, I'm, I'm just going to do it. I am going to be the different person. I'm going to be the one to ask to change the music in the gym. I am going to be one that always got me, and I'm not going to name the player, but she always used a comment if I had navy blue and black on in one outfit. <laughs> so then I used to get dressed in the morning before, and this is as an adult at Quinn's, and I was like, oh, no, I can't wear navy blue and black because she's going to comment. And oh, then name and shame her. Name and shame her. I was like, do you know what? I don't, I'm going to wear navy blue and black because that is what is available. And then it got to a point where I would wear navy blue and black just to wind her up and see if she commented. <laughs> and then it gets to the point where you then, you're not even being commented on because you do it so often, because you do something different so often. And even with my hair, like before I, I cut most of it off, I'd have all of my different hairstyles, etc. And again early days it would be oh like you got cool hair or that's nice and it's all, all complimentary stuff but people would comment it or notice it and then it got to a stage where nobody's commenting or noticing my hair and I was like I must be fitting in this must be something I need to change something here then I decided to shape half of it off and then I get my cool get my cool shapes I was like oh yeah that's cool but even still it gets to a point where people not they don't notice it or appreciate it but it just becomes a normal so whilst it can be hard at first and you do get what what are positive comments, but sometimes even the positive comments, you're like, oh, I just want to get on with it. Like, I've just done my hair how I want. I don't need compliments every day um, with stuff. Sometimes you do just want to get on with it, or maybe you've lost a lot of weight recently. And again, people saying, oh, that you look really good, you lost weight, but sometimes you just, just want to get on with it, you know? Um, but eventually they get used to you. They get used to a bit of difference, and, and so it kind of... It just becomes a norm, but you do have to go through that sometimes emotionally draining stage. But then you come out of the other end and it's like, oh, I can do whatever I want. And, and especially someone like me now, I do some bizarre things, but nobody's ever surprised anymore just because mm -hmm. they kind of expect it from me. And I'm like, oh, I thought it was pretty cool, but it's all, it's all a bit normal now. Well, I definitely would say, like, you know, if you reflect back when you first started playing rugby or even first into the England setup like your character is really blossomed and now you are who you are. Were you always this type of person and holding back a bit and finding your feet or was it just actually it's quite a challenging environment initially? Um, I like, I've always been this, no, that's it. I haven't always been this person inside. I've, I've learned to be this person that's completely happy with myself and where I put myself in my surroundings and how I act, how I talk, etc. But like being in the England camp, especially, I went in and I was completely new, but literally to everything. So I was brand new to, to the England environment. I was new to the England way of training and, and the whole training full time and doing double sessions. I was new to sharing a room with the wonderful first roommate I ever had. Best she roommate makes ever. a great cup of tea, everybody. <laughs> really good. <laughs> but like that learning to share your your only personal space with a person it is new but then just to rugby so you know going into England camp is daunting enough and, and most girls have grown up in age groups and sort of know each other played with each other county clubs whatever I went in there knowing only you Rachel and a couple of the other Quinns girls can't even remember who was in at the time but that bit was daunting and I remember I could like hear people asking questions about me two other Quinns girls and they're like that but even I don't know that well why don't you ask her but they never kind of asked me just I don't know didn't I don't know if I was scary or didn't want to seem rude to ask or whatever so that that side of things was tough and I would always I don't necessarily say try and fit in but almost not not be my standout self and I'll just try and go along with whatever the flow was but then it's having someone like you Rach, in my life to say no, if you want to listen to the music you're listening to, go and put it on the playlist. Like, if you want to walk around with hot sauce in your pocket because you need to put it on your food, do that. There's no point in coming here to this tough training environment and, you know, tough emotional environment and still making yourself sad because you're trying to not stand out. And especially 
with training as well. So I always remember one of my first meetings with Mids after like, that week and he said, how do you find it? I said, yeah, it's good fun. But I've not come here to, like, he said, how have you found it with the girls? And I said, I've not come here to make friends. I've come here to play rugby and learn how to be a bit rugby player. And he found that hilarious. But <laughs> also it was like on a training pitch. So trying to learn, I think only rugby players will really understand like what level we train at, whether we go hard at everything or whether it's like what we call the gentleman's agreement and the ladies' agreement where you sort of just go a little bit in and just kind of trying to find my pace. But then I say, we've got someone like a head coach saying, no, you need to go full in. And then someone like you also saying, no, like feel free to stand out. You're here because you've stood out in a club setting. You're here. You've only been playing rugby for two years and you're here because of what you've been doing. So like, try not to change that. Um, so it, it is tough and you ask a lot of questions. You kind of find your your friends and your allies and people you can either confide in and, and the amount of times that we would have sat in a room and just had a good moan. And it's not anything to do with personal by anyone or like you don't always need constructive feedback. Sometimes it's just let it out, have a good moan. Um, but then you, you find a way around and you just... Like anything in life, you've got to just find your feet with it as well. And so w was there a time or a period where you you felt this becoming of being the character that you are and the person that you are? Was there a moment where you felt really comfortable to start being that? And, you know, obviously everybody knows about the, the documentary. Was that a turning point or was it, could you remember a time or did it just happen? It was the, the thing that stands out when people ask that question is around COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement. And we was home a lot. And I was, we was all sent, well, a lot of women in sport were sent a BBC sports survey. And I, and I just filled it in because that was a nice thing to do. And I answered it honestly. Um, and then I got a journalist phone back and just say, can we talk through some of your answers? I said, yeah, of course you can. And she just said, I just want to, like, there was a lot of similar answers to our questions but one of yours stood out because when we asked did you challenge it you were one of the only people who said you do challenge it and especially my method of challenging is generally sarcasm because you know you don't want to put people off you want to bring people in and comment um and challenge what they're saying about particularly about women's rugby in this case um but it was just the fact that she her name's becky gray at the bbc and she's done wonders for me in, in speaking out loud and saying these things. And her constantly reminded me that people want to hear this. And, and she would ask me certain questions. And I literally think, oh, I don't know if I should answer that. She's like, why wouldn't you want? Like, it's your truth. You're not, as long as you're not lying, you're not, you're not telling any untruths, then journalists are generally on your side and they're going to write it in a way where you don't look like a, a bit of a donut. But it was the... Yeah, that moment filling out that, that BBC Sports Survey and Becky getting in contact just to want to talk about it. And then realising in my head, I had sort of had this moment when I thought, what do I stand for? So if you took away, if you looked at my socials and took away all of my rugby pictures, anything to do with rugby, who am and even particularly family, like who am I? And that, that moment in time was like 2021, whatever it was. And I thought, I'm not sure. Like I knew who I was inside but it wasn't often that I would express it on the outside. So I thought to myself, I need to be more vocal with what I stand for, with my thoughts on equality of opportunity, with in inclusion, diversity, how I feel sometimes in different environments, how you can make other people feel and just saying it out loud. And that's when I started realising people, people want to hear it, like particularly journalists, because that's who was giving me a platform. I would just like put small bits out on my socials and then a journalist would follow up and say like, did you want to talk about it? And you could say yes, you could say no. But I, I generally tend to say yes. And it was, yeah, that kind of moment when I was like, people want to hear it because then I would put it out, whatever the result was, whether it was a, an interview, a report, a word in video, pictures, whatever it was, I would then get a lot of good feedback from people literally just saying, thank you for saying that. Like, thank you for saying it out loud in the public domain that's how I've been feeling for months or years. And thank you because nobody ever says it. It's like, oh, wow, there's actually a space here for me to be myself. And again, that was the part of me growing into the person I am now. I'm feeling so free to, to speak out. And part of my mission is to try and get other people to do it as well. Whilst, you know, recognising it's tough. But people, people want to hear our truths. And especially as professional rugby players, 
you're still for me you're a human first and you're not a number you are you are a person and you can get lost in the like the only being a rugby player bit but actually you're you're a woman first or you're a man first you're a mother a father an uncle um an auntie whatever it is for me that's first and rugby is 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 the fun bit of life um so yeah it was just about realizing that, that people wanted to hear what i i had to say that there was a space for it and just trying to get people trying to get people to say their truth out loud and uh, i had a few players previously would say why why how do you get away with saying what you do because it's not always you know positive stuff saying how fantastic rugby is because it's just i'll tell the truth and i'll say well, what do you want to say and then they would kind of tell me and i said well just say that you can go on i can't has anybody ever stopped you from saying that well, well no so how do you know you can't and let me tell you if it's come through like the england comms channel they won't put anything out that's you know untrue or that makes you look bad I thought, oh no, I just can't say it. And so I still struggle with some players and I, I just say, please, like that's that's the truth. Say it out loud and they like, no, I can't do that. But so what, what would be some of your advice to, you know, young girls as well who may have challenges in the girls' teams or um, you know, and talking about elite, like how do you encourage those to to be themselves and to speak out on things? It's if somebody asks you a question, especially around feedback and, you know, it might be how, how, is, how is training? Um, how is the state of, of the team within the club? Be honest with them. I think if they've almost been brave enough to ask, you owe it to them to be honest. So you say, train is not ideal because we don't have the floodlights or we have to train it in the shadows of the floodlights because we never, ever get the main beam of the floodlights. And I go, oh, okay. Or it might be, well, tr matches are fine or training is fine, but I can never shower after training because there's always cold water. Oh, I didn't like. I just never realised. Maybe we'll have a system where we can turn it on or just little simple things. But also, just don't be afraid to say out loud what an issue might be. But you do it in a in a diplomatic way as such. Like you don't go to someone. So say it's a floodlight. Saying, "Why do we never train in the floodlights? It's ridiculous. It's sexist. Like the boys always get trained floodlights. For me, that's not the approach." What we do is you say, how comes we, we don't get floodlights? How comes we generally don't get hot water on a, on a Sunday? And sometimes the answer will just be, never even thought about it. Never, I didn't really think, I thought you girls were happy because you were just training. Um, maybe we can come up with a rotor so it, it can change over. So, yeah, it's twofold. If somebody asks you how, how things are, be honest with them. Um, but you can find a, a diplomatic way to be honest. But equally, if you're not happy with something, say it out loud. But again, you say it diplomatically in a way where you allow people to, to give you the solution. Like you're not just having a moan. If you talk to someone about it, you can do something about it. Have a solution. So if you've got a problem, also have a solution. And just keep asking until they say yes. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely about understanding, isn't it? Really finding out the facts and then trying to help find solutions as well. So, you know... I'm sure you've come across your fair share of some negativity or when you've done certain things, people may have commented of why are you doing that? Or that's not how it's how we do things. How do you deal with those situations um, that you may have come across? And if you've got any examples at all. It dealing with those is sometimes almost thinks a bit of a personality trait. So I've I kind of seem to have grown up quite tunnel visioned in how how I approach life. So I was always different, whether I was the only girl, whether I was the only person of colour, like especially playing football, I was generally the only girl, but I grew up with boy cousins. So me playing with boys was, was very normal. And then I, and someone would make a comment and I'd go home and be like, oh, mum, why did they say that girl shouldn't play football? And mum would just say, that's just because they're jealous because you're better than them. And I'd go, oh, all right. And I was completely happy with that answer. Or we'd be walking around supermarket. I'm like, mum, why is the security guard like only following me? There's those people in the shop. And then you say, oh, he probably fancies you. I'm like, oh, okay. And then again, completely happy with answer. So it's that tunnel vision. Someone gives me an answer. And then I'm, I'm happy with that. And I don't necess didn't necessarily think deeply into it. So then in terms of dealing with negativity, I kind of have the same attitude. And I just think, well, why are they 
why they're commenting, generally it's because they're jealous or because it's a bit different, it's something a bit new. And actually it says more about their insecurities than it does about you. Um, yeah, and I think rugby has a particular problem with, and we joke about the hashtag like stay humble, which is funny when we're sweeping out the change rooms and we should always sweep the change rooms after we finish with them. They should always be clean when we finish with them. But it's just like, know your place and the stay in your lane attitude when like, well, I don't even know what my lane is or my lane's massive, so I'm just going to do <laughs> loads of things. And it's like, well, in a meeting, speaking up and people are like, you shouldn't be speaking up. Um, when I got when I got my nice new BMW X4, like bright white and, you know, a bit standout-ish maybe. And it's just like, oh, that's a, who's, whose car is that? That's a, not a car that's normally in the car park. Like, that's not what we do. That's a bit showboaty. It's a bit show off. Like, no, it's just I wanted to treat myself, so I did. So in, in terms of like, dealing with negativity, I would always think, well, why are they being negative? Why are they commenting? It's usually because of, of jealousy, because they either can't, can't get it, can't do it, can't afford it, or jealousy because they've always wanted to, to say that, they've always wanted to, to drive that vehicle. They've always wanted to wear that colour combination and they've never felt comfortable <laughs> to do they it. They can't wear black and blue. <laughs> <laughs> well, they often yeah. say, um, you know, when people tell you you can't, it's their limits, not yours. Yeah. That's what the reflection is. So, and I think so many of us go through this where, um, especially growing up in, in what feels a do male-dominated sport, you're often told you can't a lot. Um, so I think in terms of that attitude towards it and thinking about that, um, it's a really nice message to send to people. I mean, just we'll wrap up shortly. There's a couple of questions that have come in, but just from me, the final question is, you know, how what what tips could you give people to be yourself and, you know, to back yourself with how you want to be and who you want to be? Yeah, it's the first one would be to find out who who you are and, and who do you want to be. Like for me, the moment was when I asked myself, what do I stand for? What do I want to be known for? If you took away an aspect of my life, how do I want to be known? And, and maybe more morbidly, if I die tomorrow, how would I want to be remembered? And so that's a kind of bit learn, <clears throat> learn about yourself. But then I'd, I'd also write a lot of this down. So I'd write down, what am I good at? What am I not good at? But also what do I enjoy? Because you can enjoy something that you're not particularly good at, etc. And it's a lot of uh, like the human connection and how other people make you feel. So if you come, do you come away, every time you speak to this particular person, do you come away feeling drained and you feel negative about life and you're like, mm, I thought I could, I thought I could give running a marathon a go, but now I know I definitely can't. Or do you go to the person in the middle who you say to them, I feel like running a marathon and they go, um, yeah. Yep, good idea. Why not? Um, yeah, give it a go. And then you can kind of come away thinking, maybe I can do it. Or you go to the third person, you say, I'm thinking about giving a marathon a go. And they say, what a fantastic idea. When do we start training? Can I do it with you? Like, I want to I buzz with you. I want to run with you. I want to train with you. And it's just like those three different types of people in life and working out who those are in your life. And it doesn't mean you don't need the, the first type of person at all because there's other relationships and you know, other things you might need them for, but it's just working out who is good for you, what people are good for you. How do you feel when you come away from that group of people? How do you feel when you come away from that particular person, that conversation? Um, and just, just working out who you need to put yourself around in, in different situations. And you can have the same person who's negative in one situation. It might be about sport, but you know if you ask him or her about education, they're brilliant for you. So it's just learning who's around you, how you can use them for, for your advantage. And I think the term using people seems to have negative connotations, but that, that's life. Like people use you all the time because you have a, you can offer a service or, or whatever it is. Um, but you can also use people for different situations and you don't have to have best friends. You don't have to have thousands of friends. You don't have to be everyone's best friend in, in your rugby team, but you can put your body on the line for them on a pitch. So yeah in terms of tips just finding out who you are as a person and how do other people make you feel when you, when you come away and, and realize who you need to be around for, for different scenarios i think that's such a key message it's been about 
being aware, isn't it? Aware of you, but then also who you're surrounding yourself with at the end of the day. Um, uh, if you've got time, Sean, before you got to go and go on the beach and work on that town of yours, just got a couple <laughs> of questions here. A couple have come in, same question around, what tips would you give players who want to be a professional? Cool. Uh, number one, it can be done. But number two, there's no substitute. No, nothing money can buy that will substitute for attitude and mindset. So, so for me growing up, there's nothing special I'd say about me, apart from the fact I was born 10 pounds, very heavy. That there was nothing <laughs> special about me. I could never do any push-ups. I, I couldn't run fast. Like, there's nothing special. But what was special and still is, is, is my mindset and attitude. So it's the uh, attitude to, if you can, get to training early and practice whether it's passing, kicking, um, tackling. If you can, stay a bit later and do the extras or even helping tidy up or asking the coaches, what do you think of me at training today or previous? What have we got? What sessions have we got planned? Can I help? Like even just saying thank you to a coach. As a coach now, I realise that when you say thank you to someone, like, it just feels nice. And then, then you want to help that kid more the next time just because they're polite. So politeness, mindset and attitude comes before everything and yeah money money can't buy those and that can't come from external that has to come for you so just being that person who's positive and wanting to be an environment adding adding to an environment and you're just going to keep growing and obviously you have to be good at the sport as well but you get good because you are the person who's always doing the extras you are the person who's practicing your your passing kick and tackling away from the pitch like you will never as you know Rachel as much as I do we won't improve and, and become international rugby players because we do an hour and a half on a Tuesday, an hour and a half on a Thursday, and that is it. Even if it's watching games of rugby, analysing games of rugby, um, if your training's on on video, then analysing that video of training, how could you have been better last time? And so it's not even all physical, it's just the awareness of, of, of your sport, whatever it is, and always putting in those extra hours. It's those key things that everybody's born with those. You get to choose your mindset your attitude. So um, second question, this will be the last one and it's a good one, I think. Um, so Rachel Hopley has said, I manage a girls rugby team under 14s. We had a girl who joined whose family moved from Zimbabwe. Currently she's our only player of colour. Any tips of how we can make her feel more welcome to the team? Yeah, for sure. So my first step would be as, as an individual research, anything about the Zimbabwean culture. Um, what what celebrations are that? Is there different celebrations, different times of year? Is there a particular fa family member who, if they were there watching a the game, would have more almost status? So do you want to try and involve grandma a bit more or, or whatever it is? But then also ask, ask her, ask her, what would you like to see? And the fact that you're, or even just ask her about life and things, but ask her about herself, ask her about her family, ask her about food, like again, music, different cultures, just start that conversation because you're only going to improve relationships and, and with strong relationships comes a lot more truth. And yeah, so you can, it's twofold. You can do your own research first, but then also, also ask the player or potentially a parent, adult, carer, whoever's responsible for her to say, what, what do you think we could do to, to make her feel more included? And one of the most powerful stories for me was, was Zainab. Elema, who plays with a hijab and, and she plays for Richmond. But when she was playing for, I think it was Barnes, they celebrated Eid with her. She was the only Muslim person on her team. No one else on her team is Muslim. But they had a celebration around Eid, which was for her, entirely for her. And she said that just made her feel so included. It's not a separate celebration that she has to have with her Muslim friends. And you know, she can't have it with her non-Muslim friends. It was just bringing her two loves and two worlds together. So just being able to celebrate someone's differences and embrace differences and, and more importantly, ask questions and ask how, how you as a club can, can do any better. And I think out of this whole conversation, so much of it, Shauna, is you keep just going back to having conversations, being yeah. honest, asking questions, um, all in, in the right manner. And that way you can find solutions for better. Um, so thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know Mercedes Foy has got well, you she working. She's been me as we've been talking. Like, oh, I hope I'm not supposed to be somewhere. <laughs> 
Sorry, Mercedes, um, our fault, but it's been a pleasure to have you join us this week for the half-term online squad work. And look, we love what you do. We love who you are. We obviously miss you back in the UK. I know you'll be dropping in and doing a visit soon, but best of luck out there. And we look forward to watching what's happening across your socials in Cayman Islands. Yes, look forward to seeing the results of the, the rest of the half term days and it gets a bit more serious later on, doesn't it? This is a full start <laughs> flood and then you get that the leadership problems and you've got to center on with the leadership <laughs> and how to prepare for game day. That is all very important, but you can do all of it. <laughs> Love the honesty, straight up. <laughs> I will keep your cockles in the fridge for when you come yes. back to the UK. Lovely, lovely. Um, but love you, Shauna. Take care and we'll catch you soon. Lots of love. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody who joined. I'm sorry we didn't get through all the questions, but there's plenty more coming up this week. So make sure you register to get the links for all the conversations we're having this week. Thanks again, guys. Bye-bye.